This episode is brought to you by Podcorn. Now, if you guys haven't heard about Podcorn in the past, Podcorn is brought to you by the team that also brought you FameBit, which is a YouTube influencer marketplace that was acquired by Google and YouTube. Now they are leveraging their experience and offering the same benefits and same expertise for podcasters. Now, Podcorn is something that I personally use to find sponsors and branch up opportunities. And to give you a brief overview, it's a marketplace that connects podcasters to amazing sponsorship opportunities and brands that are out there. And with Podcorn, there is no middleman, which means podcasters of all sizes can browse and choose opportunities right on the platform, set their own rates, and collaborate with brands directly without any exclusivities. And the mission of the marketplace is to give podcasters transparency, creative freedom, and full control of how and when we monetize. So I highly recommend you guys check them out. If you're a podcaster or if you're a creator of any sort, click the link in my show notes to sign up to Podcorn and start browsing sponsorship opportunities. All right, guys, off to the show. Hello, friends. Today, we have Robin Sharma on the podcast today, and I've been excited to have Robin on for a while. He's uh, uh, another fellow based in Toronto, and for those of you guys that haven't heard about Robin, he was recognized as one of the top five leadership experts in an independent survey done with 22,000 people alongside the names of Jack Welch, uh, Richard Branson, Shaquille O'Neal, who knew, and uh, Bill Clinton. So, you know, for the past few years, I've been trying to knock my nocturnal schedule out and trying to, uh, you know, create a create a morning schedule as best as I could. And obviously, knowing Robin's work, his 5 a.m. club, uh, which is a book and a club that he started online for people that want to wake up at 5 a.m. and have a productive, uh, productive schedule. This is something that I was very excited about. Needless to say, Robin called me out on my BS and all the excuses that I had of why I wasn't waking up early enough that I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate with. And he even left us with some strategies like the 2020-20 routine, which is the first hour of how to maximize and get started with your day from the moment you wake up. He talks about why it's important to work around your energy instead of time and how to maximize those things. Um, And we talk about a lot of other things around how to become a better productive worker, how to become a better leader, and ultimately how to lead your best life. So it was very motivating, incredibly uh, inspirational, and I'm very excited to have the one and only Robin Sharma on. Thanks guys. So as we discussed right before the call, uh, I'm currently here in Spain. You're in, you're in Toronto. Spain is a bit tricky in terms of the way they, uh, I guess, the way they have their scheduling set up. Meaning, everything is a bit later. I would say a lot later than perhaps what the 5 a.m. club is uh, all about. You know, people here have dinner at 9 p.m. Sometimes 10 p.m. They go out before COVID times, of course. And they have their siestas at four to five, everything here and closes. Uh, and people generally get up a bit later than perhaps what most people do in the rest of the world. I'm having a difficult time. I, I always feel almost this nocturnal sense because uh, I've always been like this a little bit. So Spain actually is a good fit to my schedule. But for someone like myself and other people that may be more nocturnal and staying up a bit later uh obviously you have the 5 a.m club what are your suggestions or advice for people like myself that have had such difficulty waking up so early well you know i'd say i'd say first of all if you're used to going to sleep late and sleeping in more i'd say to anyone just give it a try 
You know, it's like if uh, someone's resistant to a certain type of food they've never had before mm. and they don't embrace it, they might just miss their favorite new food. It's like if, uh, oh, I don't want to talk to this kind of a person. Usually I talk to entrepreneurs, but you might just miss talking to the person who becomes your new best friend. So one of the great things about being a human being is we're built to change. We're built to adapt to new conditions. We have neuroplasticity, which, as you know, is the brain's ability to mold and to grow and to develop new neural pathways. So I've um, – and it, through Europe, so many people have embraced the 5 a.m. club. They've read the book and they've joined the movement. Mm. So – I would say give it a try. You know, I'd say look at the, the the research of University College London that says if you do anything for 66 days in a row, you get to a point of what they call automaticity, where, Sean, that's where it becomes easier to do the new habit or skill than not to do it. Mm. So, you know, in the 5M Club, there's the line, all change is hard at first. It's messy in the middle and it's gorgeous at the end. And so it's, it's like when you're trying to work out or learn any other skill, maybe it's skiing, maybe it's surfing. It's hard at first because you're going through change. It's messy in the middle because you're letting go of the old ways. You haven't quite wired in the new ways. But once you've installed the 5 a.m. club habit, you're up at 5 a.m. You've got an hour to run the 20-20-20 formula that I talk about in the book. And it's 6 o'clock and you feel fundamentally different cognitively physically, energetically, spiritually. It's a, it's a brilliant way to start the day. And the last thing I'd say about that is if you don't want to do it every day because you'll, you know, you'll want to go have some fun and enjoy some sangria because you, you told me you're in, you're in Spain, you know, and have a beautiful meal with your friend, then do it four times a week. Do it five times. Do it on the days that you need to be incredibly productive and focused and take a few days off. That's a good balance too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I do want to approach this with a, with a growth mindset. You know, some people say that, oh, you're just born as someone that is meant to go to bed later or you're, you're, some people need less sleep in general to function so they can wake up a little bit earlier. So I do want to approach this as, 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 a, as a way to think about it as like, yeah, like no, it's not everyone is malleable. Anyone can really approach it in this in this way. I think the difficulty part that I've had is like when I do wake up, I need to have some sort of a routine or system that helps me almost automate my day once I do get up because I don't want to have to think about like, oh, like I already have, I'm already going to be so tired, you know, at 5 a.m. I don't want to have to think about things that I need to do. And I think this is where the 2020 20 uh, system that you have is perfect for something like this, where you can maximize that hour of your day. Can we go into a little bit about what got you into creating something like this and a little bit about breakdown of what it is? I, I sure would love to, Sean. Before we do that, I just want to speak to what you said, which is, you know, you have the growth mindset. And I know that's such a key part of your theme and, and what you do with this excellent podcast. And then you said, you know, and I'll get up at 5 a.m. and I'll be really tired. And I would just invite you to play with the idea, what if you weren't tired at rising at 5 a.m.? Because in the book, I talk about the importance of a pre-sleep routine. Mm. And what I'm actually suggesting, and I've been at this going into my 25th year, teaching people elite performance leadership. And part of that has been the 5 a.m. club in the morning routine, which is now, you know, so it's so popular and it's so wonderful to see so many people dialing in the way they start their day. When you do this method with fidelity, with commitment, with enthusiasm, it's almost like this upward spiral of success you're doing the second one workout that I talk about in the book. You're getting the two massage protocol. You've got a great pre-sleep ritual. You've got your 20-20-20 morning routine. You're running the five great hours ritual I talk about in the book. And all of a sudden, you're getting fitter. Your cognition is increasing. You're wiring a new neural pathways. You're loving your life more. You're releasing more dopamine. You're sleeping more deeply. You're eating more cleanly. What starts to happen is actually you don't wake up exhausted and tired like one might think. Mm. 
So it's it's applying everything, all of the different methods in the book with consistency, and then just enjoying the process as you wire it in and get the benefits. Gotcha, gotcha. And and how important is the five a.m.? Is there any is there any science or research to why five a.m. is such an important number? I guess I'm curious to know why you didn't choose, let's say, six a.m. or four a.m. Is there a particular reason why five a.m. was such a chosen number? When, when I have worked with so many uh, uh, titans of industry and elite performers, uh, NBA athletes, etc., so many of them had one thing in common: they loved getting up at five a.m. They, they just loved 5 a.m. Nelson Mandela on Robben Island would get up every morning at 5 a.m. to do push-ups, and he'd, he'd run on the spot. Howard Schultz, who you know, essentially scaled Starbucks, 5 a.m. Michelle Obama, 5 a.m. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, 5 a.m. So what I would say is between 4 and 6 a.m., I think it's the time of greatest quietude. I find it really interesting how many of the saints, the monks, the sages, the great philosophers were up between four and six. And I would guess it has something to do with the energy in the air. I would guess it had something to do with the tides. Um, you, you ask for science, there's a relatively recent finding that the brain has a mechanism that washes itself while we sleep. So you wake up at 5 a.m. or it could be 4 a.m. and your brain has been cleansed. I also think at a spiritual level, you've left the day, you've slept, you've washed away the residue. So I think that time between four and six, it's not only the time when most people aren't checking their phones, there's not a lot of notifications coming in. It's not as noisy in a world that has overwhelming levels of digital distraction. But I think it's almost a time where your mind, your heart, your body and your soul are most available to be influenced. And that's why reading, meditation, journaling, praying, all those things I talk about in the book are so incredibly valuable at that time of the day. Then at six o'clock, you feel fundamentally different. And, you know, the way you begin your day sets up the way the rest of your day unfolds. You've mm -hmm. given yourself that hour to release the serotonin, which makes you feel better, the dopamine, which gives you more fire, reduce the cortisol, you've worked out, you've done all the things that I talk about in the 2020-20 formula, and you feel so much better. And a lot of people tell me by eight o'clock or nine o'clock, they've got more done than most people get done in a day, they feel better, they're more resilient against stress, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, th there is something to watching the sun rise, or at least getting up before even the sunrise, I guess they call it beating the sun. And there is something that is a bit stressful when I wake up at like, you know, when, when the day has already begun, the sun is already up, people are already walking by. I feel behind a little bit when I look out the window and I see people already hustling, bustling, maybe less in COVID times, but in general, th there is something to that. So I, I totally agree. Um, to go back into the 2020, 20, I know we touched on a little bit, but can we break down for the people you know, what exactly does the 2020 routine entail and what it's all about? Absolutely. So I get into granular detail in, in the 5 a.m. club. But for now, high level overview, it's uh, tw three pockets, the 2020 formula, three 20 minute pockets. The first pocket is called move. The second pocket is called reflect. The third pocket, you love this, is called grow. So, you know, I, I always suggest give yourself a 15-minute runway, get up at 445. It's pretty much the same as 5 o'clock. You get to do your personal things. Now it's 5 a.m. You get to hit the, round, hit the ground running. What's the first thing I suggest anyone does? You embrace that pocket called move from 5 to 520. Start running. Maybe it's running on the spot. Maybe it's skipping. Maybe it's spinning. The key idea here is to sweat. Science has confirmed when we sweat, we release BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which John Ratey at Harvard University calls miracle grow for the brain. BDNF is, is this amazing substance because what it does is it actually promotes neurogenesis, which is the growth of new brain cells. Hmm. BDNF actually accelerates the connections and the density between all our neural pathways, which 
increases cognition and processing ability. BDNF actually repairs brain cells that have been damaged by stress. So you're sweating, you're working out first thing in that uh, move pocket for 20 minutes, you're hydrating, which increases uh, mitochondrial function, you're releasing dopamine, the inspirational neurotransmitter. So Sean, you wake up tired, but one of the brain tattoos I believe in is the way you wake up doesn't doesn't mandate or you know re- require the way you're going to feel an hour later or even 20 minutes later. Sure. So you right so you're working out, you're releasing dopamine, that makes you feel better. You're releasing norepinephrine. Norepinephrine boosts focus. Ever notice the days you work out, for some reason you can sit down and you you can just stay and read and study and focus. And sometimes the days you don't work out, you're just a bit more all over the place. You know what I'm saying? That's norepinephrine. So just by doing that, you have activated a pharmacy of mastery within your brain, and it's available to every one of us, but most of us don't do it. You've also jump-started your metabolic engine, which gives you more energy. You start to burn even more fat. Uh, I also, while I'm working out in that 20 minute pocket, I often watch a podcast or I will watch a documentary or I will read and I have this cocktail. I don't have it right here, but you know, I'll have vitamin C in it and I'll have, um, you know, some, a green supplement. Now it's 520. I'm feeling fundamentally different. I've spent 20 minutes already learning while I've worked out. I've activated, you know, I've awakened my cognition. My energy is is great. We get into the second 20 minutes from 520 to 540, second pocket of the 2020 formula, which is reflect. Well, we live in a world where I think a lot of people have fallen into the trap of superficiality versus granularity. We snack on content. Our conversations are quick and superficial. We don't spend a lot of time in philosophy asking ourselves, what are my values? Who must I be? What must I improve? How must I conduct my life for it to be a heroic life? And then we end up at 50, 70, or at the last hour for our last day. And we say, well, I live society's life, but I never got to know myself and live my life. And I think that's the greatest heartbreak of all. And I do believe your days are your life in miniature. So as you handcraft each day, so you handcraft your weeks, quarters, years, life. So you just have to get your mornings right and your days right. So that second pocket is where you get to read a piece of philosophy. You can, I mean, I'm always surrounded by philosophy. I've got so much around me books, but you can read, you can write in what I have right here, saved my life, my journal. You can spend 20 minutes praying, which I do very often, very powerful. Uh, You can meditate, which I really love doing and I recommend to people. Or you can just sit in stillness and solitude and silence and get to know yourself again. I mean, Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician, said most of man's miseries derive from his inability to sit quietly in a room with himself. No, that's so true. Right? That's why we have to reach for the phone. We have to eat. We have to watch TV. We have to go out because we're escaping who we truly are. But if we don't have a strong personal relationship, every other relationship will be degraded. And then the final pocket of the 2020 formula, which is part of the foundation of the 5am club book is uh, again, you'll like it, Sean, it's grow. And um, when I mentor the billionaires and I work with Starbucks and IBM Watson and Nike and all these companies, the best of the best, they do have the growth mindset and they have an incredible obsession with curiosity. You see, what makes a victim is they love TVs. What makes uh, a leader is they love education and learning. And uh, the thing about a master is she never thinks she's a master. She never loses the white belt mentality. So 20 minutes in a world that doesn't study anymore, in a world that doesn't really want to go granular on their skill, this is where you get to watch you know, your podcast, you get to do an online course for 20 minutes, you get to read, you get to review your journal notes, but you spend 20 minutes minimum just in 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 growth and learning. And that essentially is a high level view of the 2020 formula. And then in the book, I've got the 10 rituals of G- daily genius, which also accelerate productivity exponentially. 
I love it. I love it. Now, in, in terms of making this a consistent practice, you know, a lot of people can try and experiment, tap their feet into the pool, try to get this in, and maybe they do it once, maybe they do it twice. But to do it for a lifetime is a very different animal, right? And it's only a few people that actually end up sticking with it. If you're talking about New Year's resolutions, it's a good data point of how people just don't stick with their goals. They don't have a system. How do you recommend and advise people to have this level of consistency with a routine such as waking up at 5 a.m. and other things that can translate? Well, it, it's the, the word I would offer is maybe not a word you've heard your guests use, or maybe you have, but it's it's terroir. Never heard of it. Or may, <laughs> okay, or yeah. maybe I'll offer, you know, but you love growth so i want to i want to you know i want us to have fun in this time together and terroir or ecosystem mm. so here you're going robin what are you talking about here's what yeah. i mean look i could give you an easy answer and i could say the way you wire in a habit is you wire in a habit you know i mean so many the the, the card carrying members of the majority want the rewards of world class but we're not willing to do the requirements of world class makes no sense. We, we want a beautiful life. We want great fitness. We want work that has meaning. We want beautiful family relationships. We want respect from our peers. We want to have a massive impact on the world. But we want to watch the Queen's Gambit every night for five hours. Yeah. It's a great show though. It's, <laughs> yeah, it is. So maybe, not, maybe not the best example. Um, but, you know, heart is good. You know, pursuing that which is hardest is that which is most valuable. And society has brainwashed us and actually hypnotized us into seeking what is easy. So how do you lock in the 5 a.m. club routine so it becomes easy? Well, the first thing you do is you start to think through some philosophy and you start to ask yourself, how do I want to conduct my life? Do I want to be a heavyweight on the planet or I do, do I want to be a lightweight? Do I want true psychic joy, which comes from doing difficult things? Or do I want to be part of the easy group that never really knows their magic, their craft, their impact, and true honor. And the more you can immerse yourself every day in your philosophy and your values and connect with your mortality, you know, that how do I want to have, how do, how will I wish I will have lived on the last hour of my last day? Then you start to live life to the point. So that's one way to approach it. But terroir is if, if you enjoy a good glass of wine, for example, and you go to a, on a wine tasting, you will learn uh, on the vineyard, there's the terroir. And the terroir is the wind, and it's the climate, and the quality of the soil, the quality of the vines. And the terroir is the environment that creates either a great wine or a mediocre wine. Mm. And life is too short for a bad, of a, a, a bad glass of wine. So... Where am I going with this? If you really want to upgrade your routines and be a member of the 5am club in good standing, you got to look at your entire terroir. Because your influences are affecting your mindset. And actually, it's not just mindset. There's three other interior empires I introduce in the book. Mindset, heart set, health set, and soul set. Mindset is only our psychology. Human beings have, have a heart. We have our emotionality. We have our bodies, our physicality. And we have a spirit, our soul set. So once you start to look at your influences, the people you hang around with, the TV shows you watch, the books you read, who you follow on social media, what food you eat, what your spaces are like, what your office is like, what your car or bicycle is like, what your tools of the trade are like, the clothes you wear, the nation you live in. And you start to have a good hard look at what's toxic and what's inspirational. And you have the courage and wisdom to clean out all those victims, you know, those people who make you feel bad, those places that make you feel bad, those social media influencers you follow that make you feel bad. Then you start to upgrade and amplify your native ability and willpower and energy 
to make the choices that are most aligned with your highest self. So your terroir is one of the biggest reasons why someone will get up, you know, try something for two days. Like, you know, that's like Michael Jordan saying, I want to win the NBA title and I'll practice for two days. I'm not judging. I'm just saying it's a pretty weak way to live, isn't it? Right, right. Yeah, so it, it's not just being goal-driven. It, you have to change your entire environment so that there's not going to be distractions that even despite how focused you are, maybe you're going to be swerved this way because you saw something on Instagram or because you had a friend that's dragging you down and all of a sudden this pathway that you're on is no longer the one that you're on and I guess you go into this negative cycle back to where you were and it's it's a it's a long step but i think it's 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 difficult for people to do that i mean you're talking about getting rid of people that are bad for your life and some people just don't have the courage to to do that and yeah it's 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 i guess i'd be curious to know what are some of those specific strategies that can help people build a better environment around them well, before I answer that, and I'd love to answer it, I would actually offer a key principle with great respect and appreciation for all your viewers and listeners around the world. And I think it's important. You know, you mentioned some people don't have the courage to delete the energy vampires, for example. And I would actually say they do have the courage. They just haven't, they just haven't owned their courage. You know, I've gone through a lot of hardship in my life. And the things that have broken my heart and brought me to my knees, those are the things have, that have introduced me to my courage. Getting up at 5 a.m., it's, it's not always easy. But it introduces you to courage. I'm working on my new book right now. This is month number 11. I'm, not, I'm, I'm no guru, Sean. I'm, I'm a very ordinary person. I'm a father. And I just try my best to, to be a humble servant for as many people as possible. But I'm on month number 11, and this is like a war I'm in right now. You know, my publisher said it's great. What are you doing essentially? Why do you keep on polishing it? I'm, lock, I, I'm just coming off nine days where I pretty much locked myself in a room. I fasted for seven hours and got up only a few times and pushed through some difficult chapters that were very technical and stayed with it and stayed with it and stayed with it. And if, if, a, if someone who grew up in a town of 2,000 people from immigrant parents and very humble be beginnings can do it, anyone can do it. So we do have the courage and we, in, we learn our courage by doing the things that we're resisting. We learn our courage by doing the things that we're resisting. And this is, it's a process, you're right. We remake ourselves and we restructure ourselves from any form of victimhood into hero heroism by consistently and incrementally. You know, I'm not saying we have to re upgrade our terroir and our lifestyle and even our morning routine in revolutionary ways. The secret to world class is not revolution, it's evolution. There's a line in the book that I've been teaching for over 20 years, small, daily, seemingly insignificant improvements when done consistently over time lead to stunning results. Mm. But if you use your days and especially your mornings as platforms to make those tiny wins, those incremental micro wins, it's amazing how far you can get in three months. So how, what are some, what are some techniques to, to, to become braver and to, to be more consistent? I mean, you know, it, it is just remember that, uh, I think it was Lao Tzu or Lao Tzu, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You've just, if you want to run a marathon, you've just as simple as it sounds, walk around the block tonight. If you want to get up at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning, get up at 5.30 or 6 o'clock. If you want to read for an hour every night, the, the, the method in the book is called the 60-minute student. Read a page tonight. If you feel you're addicted to social media, turn off your phone and put it in a baggie and put it in a drawer or in the trunk of your car for an hour. If you're grumpy all the time, practice not complaining for an hour tomorrow. And it's those, you know, it's, it's how does, we talked about the Queen's Gambit. How does someone become a world-class chess champion? You make the first move. 
Right. So that's one idea. And then I think the second thing is a written schedule is incredibly powerful. So the things that you schedule are the things that you get done. And just the very act of writing out a weekly schedule Sunday morning, it, what you write down actually boosts commitment. Writing things down boosts commitment because it's almost like you're making a self-promise to yourself. Yeah. Also, making public commitments is powerful. You tell people, you go on social media for the next seven days, you won't, you know, I will be getting up at 5 a.m., joining the 5 a.m. club, et cetera. I think that's important. And then learning is incredibly energizing. I don't know. I don't really get a lot of energy on social media. I don't, I'd love to know what you think. But when I read a book, I just, I just get energized, you know? Like I'm looking at these books that I have right here. I just... I got this beautiful one. Um, My dad gave me this series of books that aren't available anymore. If you want to see the series I have, I'll show them to you. But so this was one of the missing ones. Influence of habits. You know, yeah, I hadn't planned to show this to you, but you're asking about habits. Yeah. And uh, I just went on to Amazon, and I it's obviously old, and I found this one. And I mean, here's here's my dad is a here's some of the books I'm, I'm reading, you know, this is one you probably haven't seen the seven day mental diet. Pretty great. Right. Yeah. Uh, here's one of my favorite books, Seneca on the shortness of life. Oh, great book. Isn't that a great book? Great book. Yeah. And, and then here's, the, here are the ones my dad gave me. My dad's 83. He was a family physician, uh, on the East coast of Canada in a little town for 54 years. Wow. And he's a real philosopher. Yeah. He, he gave me the, these books. Like when I was about, 21 optimism Damn. amazing right it's this it's the same series look at this willpower mm. mental concentration self-control we got a little it. bit of the art of public speaking so i'm now <laughs> hunting down the rest of the series sean that's amazing i mean it's a testament to what you do despite being one of the top leadership experts you're still have this growth mindset of constantly investing in your own knowledge just to find small slivers of information that maybe you haven't thought about before or giving getting a different angle from someone else like you're always constantly practicing what you preach as well and it, it says a lot about the advice that you give to the other people well you, you know you're very kind so i don't know if you've seen the last dance on netflix about michael jordan yep absolutely okay incredible so here's what i love the season that he lost the trainer said, Michael, are you going to take the summer off as usual and come back to start training? He goes, no, I'll see you at five o'clock tomorrow morning. Wow. What makes a champion is they never stop wanting to be a champion. I'm not referring to myself at all. I'm simply saying, you know why so few people are legendary? Because the real challenge isn't rising to world class. It's hard. The real challenge is sustaining world-class, sustaining world-class, not losing the title. And the people who who, who even do what it takes to get to the title, that's phenomenal because it takes incredible sacrifice and patience and grit and all those things we we both believe in. But it's the ones who say, I've I've got the title and I'm going to sustain it. And that's why there's so few Jay-Zs. There's so few... Mick Jaggers and Rolling Stones. There are so few apples. Because even if they get to world class, they can't sustain it. And there's a model I teach, and I'm going to teach it in the new book I'm working on. And I used to teach it at the Titan Summit, this this event I used to run every every December. And it, it really just deconstructs what happens to successful people. You see, when you're most successful, you're most vulnerable because when you're successful, it's very easy to fall in love with your winning formula and it's very easy not to take risks and it's very easy to stop learning and it's very easy to become arrogant. And so I think one of the greatest snares of all time is you get to success and you stop reading and you stop hanging out with young people and you stop getting up early and stop trying to wow your customers and and innovate. You know, last thing I'll say on this is I watched a documentary about jazz legend, Miles Davis, you know, a true genius. And his son in the documentary says, you know, my dad never had any of his old records 
or previous records at home. And the documentarian asked, are you kidding me? Why not? He said, because my dad was not interested in what he'd done. My dad was only interested in where he was going. Mm. To me, that is heroism, leadership, and, and being a creative titan. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is what I want to dig, dig deeper on because you mentioned a few great points about the difference between someone that is good versus someone that is iconic, someone that is great, that stands the test of time. Beyond this ability to sustain their championship, I know you've stood in the stage of billionaires and you've coached and helped with some of the top executives out there. What are some of these qualities or systems or habits that you've noticed as a pattern of the difference between someone that is good versus iconic? What a great question. I would say, first of all, those who are, who are iconic, you know, the billionaires I advise or the athletes or the film stars, the iconic ones have a non-reality based belief in themselves. Literally, they are possibilitarians. Literally, they even, even when they were starting out, and especially when they were starting out, they had a vision of the world that no one else believed. Total disruptors. And members of the majority, the f on the first encounter with laughter, we retreat into the majority. Oh, yeah, you're right. I guess my idea to start up this new business wasn't a good idea. I guess your idea for my screenplay wasn't – yeah, what, it was silly. What was I thinking? The, the iconic ones – understand that every great idea is initially ridiculed and eventually revered. And so they continue as an army of one advancing their mighty mission until it becomes a reality. Number two, they do not feed the trolls. A symptom of world class is jealousy, being copied and being condemned. If you listen to the barking dogs of your haters, and you're cynics, you will never do anything great in the world. Be like a racehorse with those blinders on, serving, helping, contributing monomaniacal value to as many people as possible. People will be jealous. People will hate you. People will copy you if you get really good. You must continue because your good name and the world being a better place demand, depends on it. What's that? Three or four. Next. While the rest of the world loves entertainment and having a good time, icons are practicing. Look at Kobe, 3 a.m., when he was even Kobe. See, Kobe, Kobe operated like Kobe even before he was Kobe. Mm. But even when he was Kobe, he still operated like early Kobe. And so even when you get really good and even when you get amazing, you still want to have that startup fire in your belly. You still want to practice. You want to out-practice everyone around you. I mean, genetics is not about giftedness. Genetics, we all know now, is about practice. It's not the most naturally talented who wins. It's the most committed, devoted, and the one who trains the hardest at practices. Uh, what else would I say? I would say resilience. Icons, you see them on the magazine, and you think, oh, they've had it easy. You see them on, you know, whatever – the podcast, and you go, oh, wow, they must have had an easy life. No. You don't see how many times they've been bloodied. Many of them have had bad divorces. Many of them have faced catastrophic lawsuits. Many of them have been knocked down. Many of them have had illnesses. Many of them suffer from addictions. Because I'm just speaking truth based on a lot of experience here. Sure. Yeah. B big appetites allow you to do big things, but big appetites – can get human beings in trouble if not managed well. And what I would say as well is the icons are not doing it for the money. I'm not saying that money's not super important to a lot of them, but if you are wishing to write that book because you want a number one bestseller, if you want to start up that thing because you want the, 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 the new venture because you want a yacht and a plane and all that, if you are doing what you're doing because 
you want more social media followers because you really don't love yourself very much inside. So you're trying to fill an emotional hole. When you get attacked, when you get mocked, when you get knocked down and you're laying on the floor bloodied, you probably won't get up. But if you're doing it because it's your oxygen, you must get up and you will get up. Martin Luther King Jr. said, if you have not discovered something you're willing to die for, you're not fit to live. And it's, you know, the real heroes, not only in, in entrepreneurship, but Mandela, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr. Then you think of an Elon Musk, you know, you, you think of the space explorers, you think of the, you know, you think of Christopher Columbus or Madame Curie and all of those people, they weren't operating at a cognitive level. They did one of the things that the great heroes have done. They operated at an emotional level. And it's because, you know, the heart is actually a lot wiser than the head. So if you're intellectualizing that you want to win because you want money and applause and fortune, it's not going to get you that far. But if you are coming from the place of the heart where you want to help your brothers and sisters on the planet and you want to do something beautiful, through your technology or through your book or whatever it is for the world, then the world is going to reply to you and good things are going to happen. Right, right. And it seems like a lot of this is just about being able to truly know yourself. Uh, you know, there's there's the expression, I'm willing to die on this hill. This is a hill I'm willing to die on. As you mentioned, it's greatness that of people that are willing to die for their cause, their purpose, their, their mission. And I, I, th I think there are certainly people that have it and it's what make people great, but there's also people that kind of want this thing. They, they, they think they want it maybe because they have other friends that want it, but they never sustain because they don't have that one thing that lights their hearts on fire. You know, if you were to go back to your mid twenties or even early twenties, maybe late twenties, and you were to think about some of the lessons you would tell yourself that allow you to to have some sort of a purpose like this because i think a lot of people whether they like it or not a lot of their purpose comes from suffering in some ways you've had sufferings i've had sufferings uh and generally the greater the suffering you've had the the the, the bigger the purpose that you've had you know what are some of these things you would tell yourself in your 20s let's say of some of the lessons that you learned that perhaps later in your life you could really live your life with something that you could die for well, you know, I've um, I've been very blessed, Sean, that I've had some great mentors. When I was about 25, I, I clerked for a chief justice, and um, he was just one of the finest human beings I've ever met. Mm. He was hum humble, like you can't imagine. Even though he was a legal titan, he was his integrity was flawless. His work ethic was unconquerable. And, you know, he was a huge influence on me. My father has also been a huge influence on me. And my father, when I was growing up, I mean, he, he would recite this phrase from Rabindranath Tagore when I was probably in my teens. And he'd say, Robin, when you were born, you cried while the world rejoiced. Son, live your life in such a way that when you die, the world cries while you rejoice. And that's the kind of philosophy I was raised in at home. And so, you know, if I was to speak to my 21-year-old self, I would, I would say a few things. I would say, remember how and, – and this is one of the key reasons I actually wrote the 5 a.m. club. Because it's so much more than a book about a world-class morning routine that creates exponential creativity, productivity, and prosperity. It's really a handbook for anyone who is saying, like – how do I find my way? How do I live my gifts and my talents? How do I find greater happiness? And how do I serve the world in the process? Because I think the real reason people don't follow their mission is they believe that the Mother Teresa's or even the people we admire in our communities are cut from a different cloth. And one of the greatest of all 
principles for personal mastery is your behavior always, your daily behavior always follows your deepest beliefs. In other words, your income, productivity, and impact will never go any higher than your self-identity. And so too many of our brothers and sisters on the planet have been hypnotized into thinking, be ordinary. Don't dream too big. Don't laugh too loud. Don't sing your music. Don't innovate. Live inside the box. Be like everyone else. And numb and medicate yourself with this white screen. Mm. So we actually have been, we actually have forgotten who we are. And one of the greatest spiritual of all spiritual journeys is the process of remembering who we truly are and who we truly are underneath the layers of doubt, disbelief and shame and disappointment that we've collected as we've advanced through life. We are creativity. We are productivity. We are connection. We are love. We are not hate, but we've forgotten as a species, we've forgotten these things. So what I'd say to my 21-year-old self is I'd say, remember how short life is even if you get to live a long time. And remember that you could die tomorrow. And remember that a life lived for yourself is a very tiny, unhappy life. And so, yes, if you want to live in a nice house and drive a nice car, those things are absolutely wonderful. But it's not going to bring you any lasting joy, peace, and spiritual freedom. If you really want true joy, then discover some kind of a mission that involves the helpfulness of other people and that somehow activates your own talents. Then you find riches. And when I say riches, you know, in the new book, there's a model on the different forms of wealth. Riches is like economic wealth is only one form of wealth. And you know what? Most people think that a lot of money is going to make them happy and it never does. Like what makes us happy? It's work that matters. It's respecting ourself and having a tidy conscience. It's treating our family well and being good with our family and doing some things we love like mountain biking and skiing and, you know, being in the Canary Islands, having a good time and, you know, it's not that hard to handcraft a world-class life. And I don't think a world-class life requires jets and yachts. And, you know, as a matter of fact, the more things you have, the more complicated life becomes. Beautifully said. Well, I can't think of a better way to end this, Robin. Where can people find you online? Uh, obviously, we're going to link all the stuff of the 5 a.m. club, your social media, everything. Uh, where can people discover, learn and more about you, your mission and the, uh, the advices that you share? Thanks. So, Sean, uh, the mothership is robinsharma.com. And that's just, you know, sort of the content center for videos and the blog and all that kind of thing. I'm on YouTube. I do a podcast, uh, you know, Pure Value. So people can find me on YouTube. I'm on Instagram. I think it's at Robin Sharma. And if they want to invest in the 5 a.m. club book, by the way, people love the audiobook. So you can get that at, on Audible. And uh, the book is on Amazon and around the world. I think right now it's in about 36 countries. So uh, you can get it in, in your local bookstore once it's safe to be in a bookstore again. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, we'll link all that stuff down, guys. Make sure you guys check that out. Robin, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to really try to make myself get into the 5 a.m. club, slowly transitioning, getting into the 66 days for the habit build. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and we will see you guys next week.